Hello and welcome to Rule of Carnage, where we'll be talking about designing better miniature games, better than the ones we design, hopefully. I'm here with Glenn Ford. Hi. Uh, and I'm Mike Hutchinson, and today our topic will be... Today we're going to talk about uh, funky deployment zones, I think. All of the interesting ways that you can mix up and vary the uh, the old standard of how do you put your armies and your units and your little toy soldiers down at the beginning of a miniatures war game. Um, as we talked about in a previous video slash section, um, there's plenty of standard ways to do this, which are, I think, reasonably well established and accepted from the last maybe 20 years. But I think maybe mm -hmm. we can go back a little bit further than that and find some things which maybe aren't done so much uh, these days, or look at some things that you know, other games have tried more recently and see where where the goodness lies that we might throw into our own games designs. Um, Glenn, where do you want to kick us off? Um, well, I thought a good place to start is by talking about Gaslands and A Billion Suns, mm. uh, because they do have... I do like talking about unusual. <laughs> well, you do, you do love to talk about your own work. But, but to be fair, Gaslands and A Billion Suns both have, in different ways, very unusual uh, deployment phases mm -hmm. um they're 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 very different and they they have i think pros and cons to them um i think we'll talk a little bit about those deployment phases talk a bit about why you chose to to go the way you did with each of those phases um talk about may some somebody some of the problems some of the benefits to them uh and then i think i, I continue picking up some props from around the office just then so we'll we'll talk about what bits and pieces you've you've pulled out from your mighty gaming library and uh, i think you've got some some things to talk about there but we'll, we'll start with gaslands um so the deployment phase in gaslands the of the the death race scenario certainly um is lining up uh cars on a a, a racing grid uh similar as you might find in a in a normal race um other than the obvious thing of that's what they do in races is there a reason that you wanted to pack everybody's forces into such a tiny area um, right at the start of the game when, when you were designing Gaslands? It, is maybe the desire to get everybody right in each other's faces a driver for um, Death Race being one of the primary scenarios in Gaslands, or, or was it sort of the other way around? That's an interesting question. So it is actually the other way around. So it started from a um it started from wanting to tell the same narrative of the first corner in a in a formula one race being like one of the highlights one of the high points of the chaos of a of, a, of an f1 race and then it you know in many regards it then sort of goes into a bit more of a, a rhythm that's that's more um repeatable after that but that first corner is always chaos and so it felt right that the game should throw everybody together and have a bunch of cinematic action right from the very beginning which we won't talk about now, but ended up being quite problematic in some regards. Like a lot of thought and games and design iterations went into trying to make that work more effectively. But I think what actually came out of that was that I realized that because you were all setting up on a line somewhere, which needed to happen because of purely thematic reasons, and then you were setting up these race gates, which was, for me... Um, trying to establish a, a an objective system, a, a, a game mode that felt very different to anything else that you would expect to find from a skirmish war game. Um, maybe, maybe we'll invent a Assassin's Creed game where you have to run a race against some shopkeepers or something, which is quite the same. But um, got, got an it, Assassin's it, Creed prototype somewhere. Yes, well, yes, indeed. <laughs> um, so actually what designing for that theme taught me was I really, really, really love um, games that happen in the middle of a table and don't care where the edges of the table were. And I loved, I fell in love with it so much that it became uh, almost a design principle for Gaslands and then almost, and then, and then basically did become a design principle for A Billion Sons, which is... Um, I, I want to be very permissive and open about what your gaming table looks like. And also because the gaming, because, because I don't care about the gaming table and how many sides it is, it also allows me to be very flexible about how many players there are. And so 
it's weird because that that st- that starting that setup line that start line for the death race wasn't a stroke of games design genius but it taught me loads of things after the fact i think it's um i mean because it's interesting because um gaslands came from i think a lot of the design came was driven by the original death race scenario and, and mm. that idea is that when we we came to other scenarios we started developing uh the the spawn point deployments for those other scenarios the sort of drop a penny you you deploy within x many inches of that and because the three player system or or more than two player system let's say for gaslands was so central um there was a certain amount of some of some of the early scenario deployments that ran up to those uh sort of um one player getting picked on by by multiple other player problems um do you i mean do you think that there was a little bit of storing up of problems by the 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 death race scenario deployment for all other sort of gasland scenarios that maybe created a little bit of a mountain in writing or do you think it's sort of well that was a problem that was always going to have to be solved anyway um so there was no sort of was would there have been a better way around that earlier on do you think for, for you death rates or for, for all the other ones i think for, for all the other ones if you were advising yourself from the future to the past would you say something about well so w- yeah so interestingly as i've been writing scenarios as i've been failing to write scenarios for gaslands recently um on my on my search for a, an interesting solo mode um i started uh, I start and actually this this is sort of how uh, I worked for um, on on uh, Mystic Skies as well. I started mm-hmm. writing things that came from a central point. So you find the center of the table and you measure outwards from that. Um, and so <clears throat> you'll you'll see this a bit in Gasland scenarios where if you have to set up objectives. Uh, to define a gasland scenario are quite often although not exclusively measure ask you to measure out from the center of the table because that's a way of saying i don't care where the edges of the table are every table has a center point just work outwards from there and so i think i would do more of that if i went back and rewrote the deployment rules for the um, scenarios in refueled now i would probably go back and just make everything tether from the center point of the table because that also gives you a number of ways of saying well if there's three players, put them out in um, 360 divided by 320 arcs, and then if you've got four, put them in 90 degree arcs, and so on. Um, so I do that... like, but I but I do think the spawn point, regardless of where it's tethered from, I think the spawn point was a really powerful concept, which I ended up building on, obviously for um, a billion suns. Mm. But it was it's a really nice sort of thing of saying like here's a portable deployment zone that can go anywhere it likes because it's just a it's just a point with a with a radius out from it mm. rather than being restricted to say okay well I can only use edges or corners or whatnot. I mean, is that <laughs> is that a sort of if that was going to be a design principle? Is that a thing about talking about where the focus of a given game and a given scenario is, and maybe defining your deployment zones in reference to that? rather than defining deployment zones in reference to the shape of the table or or where you happen where people happen to be stood when they're facing each other across the table maybe mm. 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 i don't know because it, it depends so much on it depends so much on the size of the forces involved so if you're talking about a war band of three to five people if you're talking about a sort of you know skirmishy size sort of 30 man um army if you're talking about a huge mass battle you know huge line of battle of epic tanks or or whatnot like i think those just fundamentally demand different things from the deployment zone thing so it's all it's all nice for me to say oh yeah pick a point and deploy two cars from there but that that's available to me because of the shape of the game and because of the um the size of the forces so i think it's you know it's it's partly to do with the the narrative that you're trying to explain but i think it's also some practical concerns Mm. um so in reference to the 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 gaslands uh death race setup there there's an obvious thing that I think a lot of maybe first time players or people playing their first game of Gaslands that come uh, come across where because everybody is is right 
shoulder to shoulder at the start mm. of the game of Gaslands. And fundamentally, it is a game of combat and carnage. Inevitably, there's a first game hairpin into the person next to you, head on collision, um, which, I mean, there was a certain amount of, there were, there were times when we were fiddling of ways of enforcing rules that would stop that from happening. Um, and there is an unfun thing that occurs in yep. some early games where people do that. And I think it's fair to say the decision was made to to say that this is just one of the learning points of the game. You'll do it once and you'll laugh uproariously when you do it that once. And then you'll probably never do it again because it's not as funny as it seemed when you did it. <sighs> Is there a line sometimes when you have to accept that you're not going to write rules to save people from themselves? You're maybe just going to give them a, a moment where they understand that sometimes, you know, freedom comes with a comes with a cost. <laughs> I don't know. I I, I I genuinely don't know because I think this I I I metaphorically lose sleep over this one, which is. Um, you know when you're trying when you're trying to write slightly off the beaten track rule systems i mean look any any war game that you come to i think it's pretty difficult to assume that the first game that you play before either of you has ever played this game before and you don't know what the army lists do and you don't know how the mechanics work like it's ridiculous to imagine that that first game will be an exquisite moment of gaming ecstasy like you'll probably take a couple of uh, games to figure out how or, or, you know just to figure out where the where the, the most delightful parts of the of the game and the flavor and what you like about it and so i think in some respects it's self-flagellation to assume that your game must be absolutely exquisite straight out of the gate but of course mm. like that's that's what we are trying to push for like mm. it's if, if you just attack the game design by saying well it doesn't matter if people have a bad time then you're not going to get a good game but there is a there's a there's a curve there right like where you just try and make that first that first thing as nice as you can get it and better and better and better. And then at the point where you're discussing, like, should we introduce a specific rule where ghosts, where cars ghost through each other for the first activation to stop people from, to like really show people that it's, it's bad to try and have fun in the first turn of gas lands mm. just be really sensible and put your foot down and drive in a straight ride. And it's like, well, well, I think let, them, I think let them have their fun and then they'll have fun the first time and then they'll realize it's not fun the second time. So they'll also have fun the second time because they won't do it. And that's all, that's all good. I think, yeah, I think sometimes you write those rules that give everybody a bit of pain. I mean, it, the, 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 the ghosting versions of various fixes, we're going to put everybody through a, a, a slightly less fun experience in, in learning a, a, a set of rules exceptions and alternatives mm -hmm. and things that only happen in the first activation in order to save a, a, a slightly smaller percentage of people from a much shorter period of unfun, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and yeah, and I think I think sometimes you sort of you have to sort of pays you money and takes your choice. Mm. Um, so they're talking about Gaslands, talking about the spawn point deployment. You're 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 hungry to talk about a billion suns and the 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 the, the entirely sort of left field deployment <laughs> that is uh, that is a billion suns. Um, it's it's you... not as left field as all that. I mean, like. All it is is it's just saying fast forward one and a half turns. Let's get to the let's get to the good bit. Mm. Um, and so, in many regards, all I'm saying is I'm bored of turn one. Like <laughs> boo, boo, walking forwards four inches. Boo to it. I don't want it. I'm not interested in it. Um, so what I'm trying to do is fast forward to the middle of the game where everything is already stood in each other's um, shadows and 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 that. You know, then then there's a few then there's a few funky questions about you know whether or not people should be allowed to deploy behind each other and all, what all that means. Um, but because of the kind of game it is, which is a spaceship game where things are relatively agile, um, I, actually I'm not a, I'm not 100 percent sure whether things are relatively agile because things could deploy behind you or the other way around. Um, but I mean that that the billion suns had um a deployment system where you put down jump points these little pennies and then you 
can place ships within those right from pretty much the very beginning but quite early versions of the game had restrictions about how close uh, you could deploy your jump points mm. to other people's jump points because i was still thinking in terms of old-fashioned like a deployment zone in its truest sense is merely a distance between the closest two units to try mm. and create that narrative beat and say can i fire a um, you know, a magical arrow at your hero on turn one before mm. you get a chance to move a single model in your army or not. And the mm. deployment zone normally says, no, you cannot. Let's at least have some fun with our toys before somebody starts magically arrowing them. Mm. Um, and A Billion Suns just says, well, what if everybody's magical arrows are already shoved down each other's throats? Like, cut to that moment in the battle. Let's go. Um, mm. Which is, I think, for me, like, entrenched in the cinematic um experience that i wanted like the battle of clan Defu, um from the starship troopers movie it's like a chaotic thing where the bugs start shooting energy and everything's crashing into each other and it's all swirling on different planes of um you know not all the spaceships are arranged in a nice mm. two-dimensional plane and everything and so that just became a deployment phase way of doing it Mm. We mentioned already blind deployment um, in the previous section um, from Malifaux. And Malifaux taught me this, which is the first time I played blind deployment, like, you know, a little imp started with a giant snippy robot spider next to it. And this giant snippy robot spider went, hello, crunch. Mm. And like, it was not fair, but and immediately a story was being told where... Um, I talk about it quite a lot, but the technology advance there for me was, wait a minute, you don't have to have units that are 24 inches apart. You can do something different. And mm. then you, like, blind deployment in Malifaux isn't fair because the game hasn't been built around it. But what if you built a game around that to make it so that it was okay? Mm, uh, not that it was okay, but make it that it was, like, intrinsically supported by the rest of the superstructure of the game. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of, one of the things I like... A, you know, really like about a Billion Suns is it doesn't force you to deploy your your jump points on top of each other. It doesn't force you to deploy them 24 inches apart. And in fact, across three tables, you can you can rather wonderfully have one table where the jump points are dumped right on top of each other and everyone's very in their faces. And another table, you can have jump zones that are four feet apart from each other and everyone's quietly mining their own little areas and and sort of having one, a bit of an agreement one thing that i'm quite pleased with in the jump point um system is that when somebody puts a jump point down and the other person goes ha ha i can put a jump point down right on top of you which seems like a really good idea and then the game escalates and mm. now you want to put down a battleship or something or a destroyer something with a big minimum range mm. and then you're like damn it i wish my jump point was like 18 inches away from your jump point not right on top mm. of it and that moment of frustration i think is a really interesting because you thought you had some power and you just abused the power by putting my deployment zone inside your deployment zone because that feels really powerful and broken because everything you've ever been told is that deployment zone should always be 24 inches apart and then it turns out damn it i did want that in some cases um and then mm. you have to go and re-engineer that um with your with your other um activities in the game I mean, this thing, I, it's one of the things I think is great about the game is that those moments define the, the story. It's that like you put two jump points on each other, then then you're looking at little fighter craft and a really sort of toe-to-toe, -to -toe, in close, you know, brawl if you're going to be doing any fighting, you know, as opposed to if you're further apart and you're sort of, I'm coming with aggression, but I'm deploying 36 inches away. Okay, well, this is when you're deploying the planet smashers and you're you're blasting people from across the table. And so, I think, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, you know, it's like I don't. It it, it 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 to me, it's interesting that dropping your deployment on somebody else's deployment zone isn't inherently more aggressive and more escalating. <laughs> It's it, it, it depending on how yeah, on how things then develop. It can be mm. a less aggressive thing than dropping the deployment zone further away because you're thinking, yeah, I'm dropping it further away because I need the minimum. Yeah, because I've know, got some cruise missiles with your name on. Absolutely, yeah. And so I, I just for me, it's one of those things where it really it it helps to it builds a story so quickly. Um, to my mind, it is. I mean, because I I remember there there were early parts where we were sort of defining out where you could put jump points and and where you couldn't and what the minimum distances were and i don't you know there was an early point where we just said well 
why why can't you just drop a jump point on top of the other person's jump point? What what's the downside to it? Does it just I think do... Rufus R- Rufus suggested it and I think he was just bored with all the, the, the measuring. He was like, Why do I have to measure this? Why can't I just put it wherever I like? <laughs> well, well it's just it's, right, it's, it's a quick can. And it's and then you know this is a great you know somebody asks a question and if you can't think of a good reason to say no let's not do it at least give it one one run through at least see what happens when you when you pull that lever and you and you you tweak that element of the game because something amazing might come out of it. So as we as we've been talking, I've, I've sort of draw I've made a slight realization which there's a there's a there's a historical path here that I hadn't really realized, but. One of the reasons that I was trying to shoot for this um, deployment system where you can deploy whatever you like, wherever you like, the sort of wherever you like thing comes from, um, partly comes from uh, Malifaux blind deployment, but it also comes from the experience of writing Perilous Tales, where what I was trying to do was a couple things. One was um, create a, a sort of a building tension. But the thing that's more relevant to this discussion was I was trying to, to, to create a fog of war situation, which with a tabletop miniatures game where like by definition, you put a little tank on the table and say, now you know there's a tank there. There's been a couple of interesting examples of trying to create a fog of war system. And one of the things that was inspirational for uh, Perilous Tales, which I think informed quite directly the the... I don't know what's going to arrive and where elements of A Billion Suns is um, all quiet on the Martian front, which is a it's, it's a slightly flawed game. Like there's a couple of actual proper design problems with it, but I'm really, really enamored by the overarching game. And it's an asymmetrical game where one person plays a bunch of um, sort of World War I um, uh, Americans or British, and the other one plays a bunch of tripods and... Um, you know, engine, Martian engines of of destruction. And so it's a really asymmetrical game where one person's got incredibly tall, incredibly powerful things. And the Brits, uh, most of their units have got some special rule that means when you deploy them, you don't deploy them, you deploy a pair of tokens. uh, And then you write down on your little scrap of paper, which of the two tokens the unit is. And after you've deployed like, you know, five or eight, of these units you've got like this mess of little tokens little blip counters um you know i guess i guess probably going back as far as um space hulk because i think it might even share a designer i don't know did rick Priestley work on space hulk i, well, I mean he must have been in the room he must have been in the room <laughs> anyway so yeah it's a it's a Pri- Priestley's involved somewhere and i thought that that was really delightful because what happens is the first turn of moving units up is is magically transformed into a sort of cat and mouse game where instead of just pushing everything up four inches, some things could move faster, but if you did move them faster, you would reveal that they were a tank and not um, just some rubbishy blip marker. Mm. And so I think that um, turns the deployment phase on its head in an interesting way because it says what you deploy is suspicion. You don't deploy units. Mm. I think w- one of the things about uh, the way that Billion Sons does it deploys right in the middle of the action and, uh, and and sort of right into the game and to sort of try and maybe talk about some of the the downsides because I I think we're both big fans of the way that it works for you know obviously we've done it if we hadn't been but one of the downsides I think is a Billion Sons game plays out of a basically three turns. And I think by and large, the reason for that is that, in my opinion, a lot of miniatures games play out over three turns. It's just they then have like two or three turns either side of those three turns where it wasn't really playing out. It was sort of defining itself and coming into view and you were figuring out what the story was going to be and what thing was going to be the hill on which people died, et cetera, et cetera. And A Billion Sons just goes... Well, if we can take the three turns that really matter and make them bigger uh, and, and make them, you know, crunchier and deeper, let's just cut to the chase. And make. And there, I have seen people saying, is, is it worth clearing off my table for a game that lasts three turns? And it's sort of yeah, a turn it's such a, is it's such a weird comment that Well, the thing is, it's like a, a turn isn't a discrete period of time. A, a turn isn't. Do you know what I mean? A turn could be anything. You don't know 
how long a turn takes or how but complicated it's, but it, but it's, or it's, it's funny because then you compare it to Gaslands and Gaslands has probably three turns on average but there's like 18 activations in it and so it's yeah. like well, time is fungible man like game time doubly so I mean that that is what that is one of the weird things of course because did you, with Gaslands, did you have 90 minutes of pushing spaceships around and having a good time because <laughs> yeah. that's the exact number of turns and I mean that is that's one of the interesting things about um about Billion Suns is because it it has locked into it these little if you if you have a little study of the contract system you'll see that it's locked in to go to three turns people yeah. are like oh hello it it goes to three turns what's that all about whereas well, you look at gaslands gaslands takes three turns but it doesn't tell you up front that it's going to take three turns and you don't really count the turns because there are the gear phases and everything's going on you know mm. and if you told people up front that this is a three turn war game they would probably have a similar reaction to so, that some of the people have had to, to some of the parts of Billion Suns. It's, I can, just... it's been a while since I played it, but doesn't Infinity have a pretty short turn clock as well? I think, I think, I think, anyway, I can't quite remember. I, I, likely people are shouting at me now, but um, <laughs> I think that, I think that, you know, it's probably, it, it's a bit like, it's a bit, it's, it's another one of those areas where norms have been established in uh, at least experienced war gamers' minds, where if you break from them, it's like it's like a it's like a narrative violation, and people are just like, nope, that doesn't work. Like you're supposed to have six turns of a thing, um, mm. because that's what that's what forty k has, and that's fine. And actually, you have to be really careful and aware of that mm. stuff because, um, as it turns out, if you only have half the number of turns, people feel like you've taken half of their sandwich away. Um, mm. So yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's super super interesting that. Um, the other thing is that um, um, no, actually, it's not. A, that's not a good point, and I'm not going to make it. <laughs> Take that, internet. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I, I think I think it's a very, very valid point. I think sometimes we see game design as this sort of playground. I, I've said before, the best game to play is designing games. We see it as a playground of sort of inventive thought and 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 pulling these things around and having fun with them. And ultimately, you are then throwing them at somebody who who is expecting to have a relaxed, fun time. That you know, they they're not they don't want to be part of our art installation art project or something you know they they they, they've come to the tabletop for a good time without too much you know brain loading you know and a brain loading of a very specific type a lot of the time you know people want some crunchy granularity and they want to be forced to calculate things but they don't want things coming in like left side and whapping them in the you know yeah yeah. they don't they don't want they don't want everything that they know to be questioned Mm. And so, yeah, and I think that is that. I suppose that is the the big big risk of of when we break those rules, those, those unwritten rules of standards. Is you know how much complexity load are you putting on your your players? And I think the important point is to always make sure that you're getting something in return. Mm. You know, don't don't put them through that just because you you want to to push the envelope. Put them through it because you want to say, hey, look. There's there's really something sweet on the other side of this. There's some real you know, real goodness um, out the other end of it. Um, so when I when I said that we were we were going to spend this half talking about uh, some sort of unusual out of the box thinking deployment zones um, for people watching, Mike leapt up from his desk and went went running around his little office and pulling books off the shelves. Well, and I... one one thing that occurred to me is that. Um, uh, it depends what kind of a gaming group you're in or what kind of setup you, what kind of um, habits you've fallen into. But I think one thing that is really true, um, what I was doing was I was grabbing my uh, copy of Warhammer Fantasy Battle um, third edition. Uh, Aha, which, right. This is not the original copy that I had. The original copy I had was um, completely fallen to pieces because uh, it would existed in my school library and I just used to get it out every week. <laughs> um, but even as, even as early as this, you've got, um, the sort of last stand or the kind of ambush style deployments. Mm. And um, actually that, that makes me think that the first game I ever played was Battle of Little Bighorn, um, the Waddington's game. And that in itself is a last stand setup where mm. half of the, where one side sets up right in the center of the table and the other um, has the cavalry coming from one side and the, the, the infantry coming from another. And so I think that narrative scenario play has done a lot of 
messing about with deployment zones. And quite yeah. often they end up just sort of changing the shape or changing the proximity of them. But they all, um, the best ones of them are asking the same thing, which is, is the story starting in a different place? Are the, are the dynamics of power different? And all of that stuff is great to mess around with. And I think that a little bit depends on how keen you are to create a game which feels like it's even handed between the two players um, to have like a, a battle that either one could win or whether it's trying really hard to, um, or trying m much more interested in trying to tell a strong, flavorful story where someone's going to lose, but it's how they lose um, mm. is the important question. So I think there's a lot of, potential deployment stuff from um you know all those little edge scenarios and stuff the ones where units don't turn up where you expect them to turn up um you don't get full control over where things are you don't know what turn they're going to turn up from reinforcements all that stuff mm. um and i think that whilst i like all that i suppose it, it's fun to mess about with is there are there are there ideas in that which are essentially just dice rolls and if you took the dice roll away and made them more about asking questions of players to sort of create that could you give them something that was a bit more of a toy box and less of just a thing that happens to them mm. i mean maybe that this is something we might end up talking at a later point but i guess there's there's the places in which you break the rules that you set for yourself, which is often what turns up in scenarios. Often mm. scenarios and special rules say, okay, I set out a set of rules for me, for my system, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break them to give you a, an alternative experience versus the, the rules that you're, the soft rules of, of standard uh, miniatures game design that you're breaking when you write, write your game you know um and and who's whose rules are you breaking and why are you breaking them um but i think we'll 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 certainly have to talk about designing scenarios and and breaking your own rules versus everybody else's rules i was, in I was gonna say at the point of the conversation where we get back to recommending that the first thing you do as a games designer as a budding games designer is write some scenarios for a game you already know feels like the time <laughs> that the conversation ends so with it's, ritual yeah. fervor we will recommend <laughs> By yes. breaking deployment zones by simply writing scenarios for an existing game and see why deployment zones are the shape they are. Yeah, absolutely. Take take a game that you love, try writing a scenario with different deployment zones and figure out why it is that they have the deployment zones in the game already and you know why why they made the decisions they made. Because they probably made them for good reasons. They're they're, you know, a lot of the those decisions were made for by smart people um thinking very hard at the time. He's not referring to us. It's like... <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thank you, Glenn. That was a very okay. good chat. Fantastic. Um, yeah. So uh, wherever you found this video, there will be a comment section. Let us know what you think and what you'd like us to talk about in the future. If you are watching this as a video, it's available as a podcast uh, wherever you download your podcasts uh, for longer painting sessions. If you're on the podcast, uh, Check out our faces on YouTube, see what we look like. Uh, reach out to us on Twitter or any of uh, the various social medias. Uh, but until next time, uh, it's goodbye for now. Bye. Bye.